Mm. Yeah, I mean, a little bit of friction sometimes not a bad thing, yeah. which is really weird for me to say out loud. <laughs> <laughs> Just got to the end of that and realised how weird that was. <laughs> I'm David Breer, and this is Fintech Insider News. This week, we bring you Chime quadruples its valuation, Robinhood tops 10 million accounts, and a man loses £196,000 to one-digit sort code error. All this and much, much more on today's show. But before we get started, do you love fintech? I mean, if you're listening to this right now, I guess you sort of must do, else you probably downloaded the wrong thing, I'm guessing. Great news. We've relaunched the 11FS newsletter. Every Friday, you'll receive a bit of a summary of the biggest stories of the week in our own 11FS style, along with the interesting blogs and so much more straight to your inbox. If you're not subscribed, head over to 11FS.com forward slash newsletter and sign up today. Welcome to episode 383 of Fintech Insider, live from New York City. Today, I'm joined by my colleague and co-host, Mr. Will White. How's it going? Hiya. All good? Yeah. Busy week. Busy week, It snowed in New York. It's like the the films. I know, it really was. I mean, it did it for about 14 seconds and we got very excited, then it stopped and then it was like (laughs) back to business again. But like, other than that, it's been good fun, right? Yeah. Plus the visit to the tree. Which was, yes. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I've, I've took like a, an alarming amount of pictures of Christmas trees this this week. Like I feel like a child. It's really strange. <laughs> uh, we've got a few guests just like nodding at me like I'm mental right now. So we probably should sort of move on and introduce who we've got anyway. Um, so this week on the show, we have Lindsay Davies, who, I mean, you joined me from for On Air, didn't you? But like this is going to be the first time we can kind of edit around all of the swear words that I'm definitely going to be using shortly, right? Are you, Nami? <laughs> and you were um, senior your intelligent analyst intelligence analyst at cb insights i called you intelligent analyst then which is like miss nomer i know i mean it's like (laughs) take that as a compliment from my perspective all right and next up we have john zanoff who is the md at techstars how's it going john fantastic can we talk about the weather a little bit longer or can Uh, we talk about fintech (laughs) look we're british okay like this is what we do so uh, snow was exciting sun was exciting (laughs) we can talk about trees all day long that's true my british wife said take the piss a little bit and you'll fit right in (laughs) well 15 seconds in you've uh, had a busy week a busy week. We had our uh, Techstars Demo Day just this week, graduated another nine phenomenal fintech companies. That's 170 companies that have gone through the, the Barclays Accelerator powered by Techstars. So massive, actually the most active fintech investor in the world now. Boom. Busy times. Yep. And you're taking a little bit of uh, time off after all the fun of the fair, hey? Taking a bit of time off and uh, going to continue to be investing in early stage fintech companies. So stay tuned for that. Very, very cool. Uh, and last but not least, we have Arno Castanet. Yeah, it's impronounceable, isn't it? Was that close enough or is that Arno Castanet? There yeah. we go. All right. Director um, at uh, Solution Marketing Americas for Finastra. Yeah, that's quite a title, isn't it? I know. Uh, how's it going? All good. Thank you. You had a busy week in New York as well? Well, actually, I was in Dallas and in Florida until today. So. Crisscrossing the US, slightly casually. warmer as well. Right? Absolutely, yeah. I had a had a message from Sam Moore earlier on this morning where it was like beautiful sunshine and like you know uh, oh, it was sun amazing. coming up. So, yeah, hate you, Sam. All right, let's go on with the news. First up, we have a story on CNBC, which is Chime quadruples valuation in less than a year. So Chime is now worth $5.8 billion. Nine months ago, it was only valued at $1.5 billion, which is still a pretty big number. But um, its latest fund rounding raised $500 million, the biggest single equity investment for any challenge bank so far. Uh, an unnamed source says that the company will double its employees by the end of 2020, which probably explains what it's going to do with all this money. Um, but, oh, my God, China is just exploding out here. What do you guys think on this? Well, I mean, they're they're adding a dozen employees a week. It's they're on they're on some an incredible pace. But they're the amount of money that they're pulling in. They have to. And they're they're valued at not just being in the the PFM space, not just being in the savings space, they're valued at having having already launched every single fintech product available out there. So they have a long road ahead of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot to that they need to do with all of that investment, isn't there? And I'm not, you know, given the amount of things that they are looking to do, given the amount of scale that they're trying to get to, 
um, it's going to be a hell of a lot of challenge. Like just purely on a talent side of things, keeping bringing people in is going to be really, really difficult. Yeah. I mean, we started to acquire a few companies, but I, I see that only increasing in the next couple of years. Mm. Well, as part of the statement, they did actually say that they want to try and uh, acquire more and more fintech firms, which, I mean, it, it seems a bit early in the cycle to start going for like big scale consolidations because the while everybody's got silly valuations then you know uh, you know another 500 million dollars isn't going to get you very far with things that are scaling necessarily well listen i think this the we're going to talk about a couple stories today which i think are are rates going to zero and rates going to zero signal we're about to hit a lot of consolidation mm -hmm. so i think that's actually the only way to grow and the fastest way to grow um, getting fintech expertise and, and getting distribution is only going to come through acquisitions moving forward for a company of that size. I think it's a smart move, actually, just getting ready for what's to come. Yep. And uh, I think they reached a point where uh, the organic growth is not quite done, but I think it's a great way to accelerate and do more. Mm. And especially when you think about innovation in that particular space. I mean, the other thing that was interesting is the invasion, so to speak, of the US by uh, the neobanks or challenger banks. Mm. Yeah. Uh, from Europe. Yeah. So here in the streets of New York City, we've seen a lot of advertising for one of them currently. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you've seen that as well. It's mm. literally everywhere. Yeah, you I know mean, N26 that, adverts are like yeah. everywhere right now. <laughs> and, and we've got Monzo coming, we've mm. got Revolut, we've got all these amazing products. And I think the beauty of Chime is, well, beyond being a unicorn, is the uh, appeal to particular demographics. Mm. And the, the rationale may be slightly different from their European counterparts, but I think there's need and space for them to grow. Yeah. I mean, is that, I know we talked about this before, Lindsay, but, you know, 500 million in the bank for tough times ahead. It's not like, it seems like quite a smart strategy to, to a certain degree, right? It's not out of scope of what we've been seeing in terms of mega round investments, so $100 million plus rounds going to companies that are reaching levels of scale beyond the mid to late stages. And they're doing it to stay private, of course, longer. And it will be a war chest if markets do correct and they can make more you know, affordable acquisitions. But if you zoom out, like Challenger Banks this year have already raised $3.6 just mm -hmm. in 2019, which is unprecedented levels of scale. Because mm -hmm. globally, the opportunity is you know, people around the world actually don't have bank accounts. In the US, we're just kind of underbanked and we overdraft our, our customers. Instead, if you zoom out, you're thinking somebody like Newbank is onboarding customers at a faster clip. They've got 18 billion or 18 million accounts at valued at 10 billion. Wow. So you think of the scale of these things, it's like just getting started. Mm. Um, and what they'll do with the funding, again, is probably <clears throat> make some, some acquisitions where it makes sense. Uh, their last was a company that is helping com uh, customers pay off their rent and using that as an alternative way to, to better credit score. So they'll do things that are more thoughtful for their base. And it'll be really interesting to see. Mm. Um, and then on the international companies coming here, they've been doing that for two years and it's taken them in a long time. And that's oh, because yeah. of the, we don't have open banking here. Like we don't allow companies to apply for a e-money license like in the UK mm -hmm. and you can't get a charter. So they realize that, but it's still a massive market like for them. So they needed to come here and, and they were smart to come earlier mm. because we are seeing the market open up for fintech. For yeah. Sure. I mean, it turns out the regulation is quite difficult. Yes. <laughs> yeah. which, like, which one? Exactly. <laughs> we have a state by state <laughs> process versus in, in uh, London, you've got the FCA and they've been very progressive about trying to open up innovation. Mm. Now there's two sides like is open banking right? Is it wrong? But you've got somebody taking, you know, a stance on it. And then globally, that model is spreading. Yeah. It's spreading to emerging markets. But in the US, we're still behind yeah. when it comes to looking at more progressive ways of adopting tech friendly regulations. We're trying to break up big tech, mm. doing the antithesis. <laughs> I mean, are there other big players, you know, the other big banks kind of responding to this? Because obviously Chime's got, what, like 5 million customers now. So are they... Uh, are they sort of applying the right amount of pressure on the Wells Fargo's and the, you know, the the chases to go? We better like, you know, step up a game here. I've got two points, and I'll hand it back off. But I, we've seen two things, and at CB Insights. Banks and corporate strategy and innovation teams are our customers. So they're coming to us and they're actively trying to figure out how do I integrate this technology into my, you know, stodgy system? How do I how do I stay relevant with the next generation so I'm not, you know, displaced by software or some remote, you know, challenger bank that's authenticating my customer and no longer brings them into the bank branch? Mm. And the second is they're enabling some of this. Like they're, they're spinning up white label utilities. We're seeing Google using a, a Citibank product. We're also seeing uh, JP Morgan build one for companies like Amazon who already have a solution and ride hailing companies that are looking to add services for drivers. So they're really embracing it from like two different two different ends. And I'm sure somebody's going to hop in here and talk about the ways in which they failed. And I've seen that happen in London, like corporate innovation theater rather than actual digital innovation. Mm. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, greenhouse, Finn. Mm. You know, there's been there's been yeah. some sort of missteps in that space, isn't there? But it but yeah. it feels like people are trying, right? You know, and actually the the ability to go and uh, you know spend a hundred million and and learn, so long as they're learning and understanding where those problems have actually been to to actually then not make that mistake on the same time round. But it, but it's I mean, to your point, John, like uh, Chime looking from uh, an acquisition perspective for like smaller fintechs. But I mean, is Wells Fargo just waiting to buy Chime when it gets big enough and a big enough threat? I don't think so. Uh, no, uh, I would agree with Lindsay there. No one can no one can acquire Chime at this point, which is a little bit of a different conversation. But, you know, one of the conversations is just whether it matters that you need a you're not getting any bank charters in the U.S. Mm. I know the big debate is it's harder in the U.S. I don't see that as a problem. I, I, I completely mean, that's a different, agree. Uh, again, a different topic altogether. But <clears throat> six, seven thousand. Lindsay has the stat in her back pocket on how many banks there are in the U.S. Yeah, nobody's uh, throwing we any data. We're going to get <laughs> corrected. Need, okay. Yeah. <laughs> We don't need any additional, and and having a, a fintech outsource KYC and mm-hmm. compliance to an FDIC insured bank is just fine with me right now. Well, that's right. interesting. Think- it's not being done by a bank. Oftentimes, for the digital challenger, you, not only just the banks, but the lending, they're remote authenticating through something that's like a digital identity provider. Mm-hmm. So even right. the banks aren't aren't doing the KYC. But they have to do their own KYC as they're opening these checking accounts. Yeah, they're it, it, holding adhering, to the same regulations. Yeah, so exactly. Like, adhering to standards, yeah. but not necessarily doing it themselves. I mean, on like uh, five point eight billion, that's just over half of what the IT cost is for Wells Fargo for a year. <laughs> So, you know, I think somebody still could, I mean, don't get me wrong, this is not me like, a billion's not a lot of money. Like, uh, <laughs> it's like, like 11FS is doing okay, job. but I'm like, you know, it's still a lot of money. Of yeah. <laughs> but again, New Bank is at 10 billion in yeah. Latin America. Yeah. My, my question on this, though, is it's good for them to have this much money because there's two challenges coming to this kind of uh, the current wave of, of like challenger banks. One is, and I'm not aiming this at Chime, by the way, like this is oh, yeah. across the board. Um, like the difference between cards issued, well, downloads. There's been a there's been a um, slide. That, yeah, there's been a uh, like a, a screenshot that's been going around the market for a long time. And if you push into it, it's actually downloads of the app, which is not a customer. Then the second thing is, I mean, I freely put my hands up here, having previously worked in the sector in the UK. Um, uh, you, you, like a lot of the user numbers are actually just cards issued. Right, yeah. and then the question is: so the the problems that happened with Curve recently, yeah. where people started asking questions about monthly active, that's where it starts to get. Like, I think that's the next question that comes in this sector. And on the other end, what you're saying, John, in terms of like if this banking as a service space becomes easier, and someone doesn't just offer you a license and an ability to do payments, but they help you with onboarding and KYC, don't you then get a huge collection of new players? And that kind of if I was them and I'm trying to do a universal play, and I know they've they've got that specific sort of payday, you know, we'll help you pay a few days earlier, and that's giving them a revenue stream. But like they are going quite universal. We're going to be a new bank for everyone, yeah. and in the future, maybe it's like a, a niche play. I, I don't understand that though. Like the does anybody get the whole being paid a few days earlier oh, yeah. thing? Yeah, but <coughs> surely surely it only matters once. Because then it's no. just the new to pay day. No, no, okay. The majority of people that overdraft will overdraft yeah. again, and okay. it's it's a it's a perpetuating treadmill of debt. But, I mean, it only moves one month, though. That's no, th- th- this is different to the Monzo one. So okay. the Monzo one is like a particular payment system is enabling you to get paid a day earlier, which okay. you and I have chatted about. Is like You guys yeah, have okay. passed your payments. You've had it yeah. for a decade. We don't have that here. <laughs> yeah. so, so that is actually one of one of the problems. Yeah. Um, so one of the, some of the UK banks have started. There's also a system called BAX yeah. that means that you can, you, you can see it coming a day earlier and give it a day earlier. The difference with Chime is it's like, I'm sure to cash three days early, pay me. Right. Fine. Um, that, was the, that was the growth hack for chime they back they were yeah. the first to crack at the two-day window of day ch and that that really solved a lot mm. of pain for customers yeah i mean you, you've got to think on the i mean on the the actives you know the investors that have given them this amount of money surely have kind of dug into the numbers and the it active makes, users it revenue and, and yeah i mean yeah, all um, of these good things to go assumptions like that aren't dangerous at all <laughs> no i mean yeah, like surely they I, must i mean do we do we need to talk about WeWork at this stage? Or, no, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not like, I'm, so I'm not putting, yeah, of course, they're, they're serious investors, mm-hmm. they're a serious business, they're not going to have got it completely wrong, but like, I, I think there's a lot c- of big numbers. The, the curve around, story right? coming through from the UK at the same time that you're also getting these businesses, like, I know having been the other side, like everyone was using cards issued. Mm. And we were saying this doesn't make any sense in the UK market. Why are we talking about cards issued? Like, it, what matters is your monthly active. Yeah. And they are not at, 
anywhere near 100%. And that's where I think actually Monzo's strength is, which no one realizes, is Monzo has been consistently talking about this and consistently producing very good numbers on this, and everyone else has been quite quiet. Mm. So what I'm sure they've shown is that is that opened is a leading indicator for engagement, mm. and they've proven their ability to drive engagement through launching product features. Mm -hmm. Now, that said, I don't think this valuation event is... Uh, an investor saying, okay, now they're worth a lot more. I think it is, there's a ton of money in the system. Um, when companies like Andreessen raise $3 billion funds, they have a lot of money to deploy mm -hmm. and they have to deploy it uh, in order to make their investors, their LPs happy and to raise their next fund. And unfortunately it is that kind of business. And so uh, I'm not giving them credit for actually valuing Chime higher. But without question, the investors would have dug in and are very confident right. that accounts open is a strong leading indicator of, mm -hmm. of future engagement, regardless of, of uh, the argument that it is a somewhat of a vanity metric and, mm -hmm. and engagement numbers might be much, much, much lower. I, I think two point, John, it's, it's what do they do with the money next, right? So, um, you know, I love the idea of it's like, is preparing for winter, you know, like it's like, uh, you know, get that insulation, you know, like packing those hundred dollar bills. But um, yeah, I mean, we'll see what they do with the money. I mean, from lots of big numbers to more big numbers in the next story that we've got coming up. So over on uh, CNBC, so this is Robin Hood tops 10 million accounts. Damn. All right. So the uh, free trade, uh, free stock trading app has six million accounts in October 2018, and now have skyrocketed up to 10 million accounts. To put that in perspective, the Charles Schwab TD uh, America trade merger will see a combined company serving 24 million clients. And different terminology there again, though. I guess it's like clients accounts. Mm, definitions are interesting. Uh, Robinhood is currently valued at $7.6 billion and raised uh, a further $323 million in its last funding round. So uh, it's pretty impressive, again, on the Robinhood side of things. I, I feel like they've they've hit a real, uh, I don't want to call it a niche, given the fact that it's 10 million accounts, but it kind of feels like they've hit on a problem that they just hasn't been solved in this market before. Um, I mean, it's really interesting that Robinhood have had some problems this year, haven't they? They sort of forgot regulation a few times, which is a <laughs> bit of a bit of a mistake to do. Technically, uh, December of last year, but fine. Okay. <laughs> and it, today, they actually got that product out of beta. And That's it's, true. It's live in the market. It's their uh, cash management account, mm. not a checking account. Uh, cash management. Okay. They and, did come out of the gate. Uh, as fear mongers from day one calling themselves Robin Hood and villainizing Wall Street. Let's be honest, they don't, they don't exactly have a <laughs> reputation of being straight shooters and talking about how they're going to monetize their business. Wow. Like yeah. Half a beer in, John gets like, let's really go. Yeah. Like, let's oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, seriously, like, where have you been? Um, but no, I mean, like, it's an amazing company hovering up consumers. Like, is this just like a really untapped need that's been tapped into? There's two elements to it. So they've attacked the traditional business model and they've brought it to its knees. Mm. Zero cost trading is now table stakes. Yeah, and right. we saw six firms slash fees within two weeks. They were all ready to do it, but it didn't happen until you had not just Robinhood in the market, but you had someone like Square. Square mm. has 18 million active users. That's right. because they are a publicly traded company. They have to report those metrics. And then you also have SoFi, who's been moving into the space. They're doing 7.5 million accounts and enabling fractional ownership. And next gen of these uh, free trading platforms, because consumers increasingly want to get into the markets, but there's a ton of friction. So we've reduced the cost and now we've reduced the amount to get in. So it's going to increasingly bring more investors into the market that are curious. And even when the markets do correct, Robinhood had very strong days. Like the day before Christmas last year, which was one of the worst tanks of, of the market, we, they saw accounts like one of their top days. Mm. And that just shows you like this investor demographic is hungry to get in, but they just need an on-ramp that's more friendly. And that might be Robinhood. That might be someone like SoFi or Square. As companies look to rebundle the bank, like whatever your initial on-ramp or your value proposition is, that's then going to help them cross-sell these types of services yeah. when they're financially ready. Yeah. Like if you're a you know debt refi company, should you be doing free brokerage? Probably not. Like you should probably pay off that high interest loan first, and then let's talk about the free money that you're not optimizing at your 401k, and then maybe we'll do brokerage. But like you'll see these companies start to make those those adjustments mm. rather than fast following each other to launch a debit card or a cash mm. management account. This is not investment advice, just to point out, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's uh, and, you know it's it's super interesting though because it's it's a uh, you know again it's a, a seemingly people are jumping on this in a major way that I'm not sure they have done on those other things, have they? It's a uh, you know it's an interesting thing where is this people 
I, I worry a little bit. I think we might have talked about this slightly before, but I worry a little bit with things like Robinhood and uh, free trade in the UK. Mm. It's kind of like the flurry off the back of like people kind of thinking they're going to get rich off the back of cryptocurrency. Mm. Uh, and now it's like I can like day trade stuff. And it's like, mm, I'm not sure you should be thinking that way, you know. They're probably riding that kind of wave. Speaking from a marketing perspective here, I think the name was a genius idea. They managed to really be the catalyst of a sentiment in the market and really built on this. And I think they um, one uh, another thing that was great is they make it simpler. They make it simple. They waive the fees. They really tap into that that feeling of me too. I can do that, but it's not the same as you know mum and pop and what they used to do before. Wait, not that me too, right? A different me too. <laughs> a different one. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Just no up. hashtag. <laughs> no, 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 it's a it's a different one. I promise. Fine. All right. <laughs> but I believe there was really uh, something there, and despite their problems and trials and errors and all that, I think the wealth management market is, is definitely one that is worth tapping into now because of, of the world and the way the world is changing. Mm. I think I would agree with what you were saying earlier is that sentiment of, yeah, it's a get rich quick. Mm. And I don't think um, this is real. Uh, and people will probably wake up one day thinking like, what was I thinking? Mm. But right now it's so easy. It's so there. Now in the instant, you go online, you do it. That's mm. it. This market hasn't seen a correction. It's the longest bull market of our lifetime. Mm. So it, we'll see what happens if, if things <clears throat> do pan out to go south a little bit. But again, these investors tend to hold the course or put more in yeah. or come into the market because yeah. they think now is the time. That's some crazy foreshadowing. I feel like we're going to be pulling that audio out in six months. It's like, biggest crash ever. <laughs> <laughs> it's like... Hold the course. You heard it don't, first. Don't, stay, stay <laughs> the said, course. Stick stay, with it. Yeah, stay the course. But that, that's the thing that I'm kind of worried about is like the so much friction removed from that process, people being able to buy and sell really, really easily. Actually, it always is the people who just like, you know, stick to their guns and yeah. keep their shares for, you know, don't buy some crazy shares in some crazy company. But if you bought Apple shares, hold them forever, you know, mm. as long as you can. Well, and you're Again, you're not investment on, advice. <laughs> but they've been in the market now for seven years. It's taken them yeah. to get to this level of, of 10 million accounts. But yeah. in the beginning, yeah, they had a fast ramp. They had 3 million. Then they quickly surpassed 35 and 40-year-old incumbents mm. with each trade. But what they've started to think about more meaningfully is how do we educate the investor on our platform? They acquired a company called Market Stacks. It's, mm. it's an investment newsletter. They're trying to fi find ways to engage them, adding more, you know, the voice of the next generation of investor. And they'll, mm. they'll trial it and error that. But again, these are brokerages and they have to hold to, you know, advisory standards. So there's a, a, lev a level of complexity that we don't totally understand, but they'll, they'll get there at some yeah. point. That's you, what the market, uh, sorry to interrupt, that's sorry. what the market's told us is that investors don't want set it and forget it. They want transparency and they want control. And and the, the market did swing to set it and forget it because of some opacity in the market and the the crash and not trusting your bank and brokerage. But at this point, and especially with younger investors, Gen Z, they want control. They want to understand exactly where they're investing and why. And Robinhood uh, yeah. has, has, has reaped the benefit. Mm. I don't, it's impressive that they've changed the market, that they've changed pricing forever. But I, I certainly, that was not a surprise to anyone. Well, uh, everyone thought it was going to happen in 2005 when there was a massive consolidation mm -hmm. with TD Ameritrade, with Brown and Company, with many, many others. Um, and I, I think, if anything, over the last 15 years, the Schwabs and, and TDs are just so stoked that they were able to collect you know, commissions on trades that cost them zero dollars, mm. not including clearing, but cost them zero dollars, um, that it's just been a cash cow and, yeah. and, and they're thanking the, the the world for the last 15 years of free money. I mean, is is the is the brand of Robin Hood built on, you know, basically changing that market then? You know, do, is there going to be ill will to those players who were basically, you know, holding out, making revenue on a model that really wasn't fair for such a long period of time? Or, you know, do consumers just have a very short term memory when these things happen? That's the that's actually the the quote that we'll come back and revisit and and, and find out. But I think No way, hers were way more smart <laughs> than my own. Like, she used numbers and stuff. But. But yeah, can, can Robin Hood that was this vigilante pivot into this trusted source of education for consumers? I mean, they're certainly trying with their mm. acquisition strategy. Whether they can do it, mm, jury's out. The interesting thing is, though, is the, the trading fees. I, I used the equivalent of Charles Schwab back in the UK, which is called uh, Hargreaves Lansdowne, right? And I, I don't trade that often, so I'm not like trying to day trade. So kind of you go, oh, well, I think it's like 15 pounds or something. And you go, all right. And what? then you put it in and then... Actually, the best part about it is discovering that kind of the experts aren't that good. 
because I followed a, I bought a few funds and stuff, and then I thought, oh, I'll just make a little few punts like an idiot into businesses I understand, and and I got a good return. And then I'm like, why on earth would I ever trust the the suits again? So you get the same thing, and then unless you're trying to day trade, it's like it's like fifteen pounds or fifteen dollars. You're like, well, okay. So I don't know, but then but then you've captured me. Like I'm captured ten years ago, and so the Gen Z guys will just like if you're coming through and you're in you're depressingly 10 years younger than me you're probably like why would you ever pay 15 or however much it is you know per trade so mm. these customers will pay they'll pay for services they'll pay mm. for subscription fees and if you look at um squares quarterly earnings you can see that they're making their most money on subscription services and mm. that's where the revenue is coming from and that's right. increasing on the cash management account yeah. uh, the cash card rather and then also on the um, smb and the peer-to-peer -peer between them so they're willing to pay but you have to provide a service and you're gonna have to prove that and like mm. you said if you're not providing me return Turns, mm. what, what is your value add? And, and what do you think that is? I appreciate you have a T-shirt on saying you won't give opinion. It's all about data. <laughs> but um, cool T-shirt, want Thank one of those. You. You want um, one. But um, I mean, why is that? Is this a just people like the security of like knowing what they're going to be paying month on month for something, or is it something other? Transparency. So price transparency has been missing in the market prior to 2008. Customers didn't know, you know, fees. They didn't, and some of that's still buried into certain products like a checking account, and mm. the and the poor people are the people that subsidize those fees. And it's a thirty-two billion dollar industry that's that I'm passionate about seeing go next. But transparency was like the number one thing. Like, just tell me what I'm paying and and what I'm getting for it. Mm -hmm. And robo's were the first to kind of come into the market ten years ago. The robo advisors, you're paying twenty five bips, and it's on base level AUM. And then we're going to continue to, you know, lower that as we get more people on the platform. Mm -hmm. But if you go to a wealth management advisor, they're going to front load a bond, they're going to show you all these things, and you don't know actually what you're paying until the end of the year when you get your statement, and then maybe it's riddled with a bunch of taxes that you owe. Mm -hmm. It's still really, really complex, and that's a, a space that we're going to see opportunity in, mm -hmm. I think, next year. I mean, a lot of people love sort of opaque nature of things. It's where money is made, right, which <laughs> yeah. is quite terrifying. But, but they made it so much simpler. Again, they decomplexify, they complexify everything. They made it simple, and people are getting a return on their investment. They made uh, this thing that was obscure, that was, you know, for older people and you need to be in a certain class, you know, a certain type, it's available to everyone. Mm -hmm. And I think the, bringing that transparency, bringing, you know, uh, fixed fees and, you know, exactly what you're paying and what you're getting for. And to, to me, as a European relocated to, to New York, uh, the way Americans uh, deal with investments is completely different. The, the way they are invested and committed to their uh, 401k, uh, the way they, they look at rates and stocks and all this, Europeans are, we're, on, we're from a different planet. Like I, I couldn't it's agree more. Yeah, like, like, I, I recognize myself when you describe yeah, you. Yeah, people are a lot more, like, I was sort of surprised. I, I Even I worked in the industry and I was like, oh, I better go through Hargreaves and go to the fund that I've been recommended. And that's and the why, thing. And yeah. why did you do that? Because your parents did it. Because yeah. my parents did it, yeah. We inherit you, these, these, yeah, right. these traits. Yeah. That's I'm why next gen is are therapy, watching us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they down then, well. Tell us all your problems. I okay, mean, like not you a, all remember going to the bank and opening a bank account mm -hmm. with your parents. Mm -hmm. Right. Just a remind, reminder that we did preface this, that this has been a 15-year bull market, and you can throw darts and outperform, of course, a stock indice. So I want to be careful that every... Joe Schmo walking down the street can throw some darts in, on Robin Hood. Of course, they've been making money over the last decade, right. but and God forbid that they expose us any significant amount of their wealth to that. That's mm. true. You know, it, mm. it, like portfolio approach is still does still make sense. It's right. transparency into fees. It's um, it's taking advantage of underbank that 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 really we need technology or we're hoping technology will solve. And mm. that's why I like the second generation of the robo, which is like the micro investing platforms, the acorns and the stashes mm. of the world. Take it and make it like a fractional, like a penny on on, an, on a savings account. For a lot of people, they don't have anything in savings. And like mm. not only is it in a savings account, but it's actually earning interest. And prior to the you know boom of high interest bearing accounts. There's, you're making 0 0.009 at best at a, yeah. at a bulge bracket bank on your savings. It's ridiculous. It is. Now it's you're making. Nothing, and our, our friends at Robino just launched fractional trading, right? Today. Um, uh, yes, they did. I mean, that's. It'll be interesting how quickly that becomes commoditized. There's a few oh, yes. third parties doing it, mm. but right now it's new and it's pretty impactful. Square's doing it, SoFi's doing it, uh, Stash is doing it. Yeah. I and mean, Schwab is doing it. That's the ability to take five dollars. Mm. Uh, I mean, that opens mm. the market up to take any five, level of yeah. consumer and get exposure to the market, get exposure to mm. uh, Apple, 
I think I think to your point though, John, it's like actually in a in a market where everything's going up, this is great. It's yeah. like everybody gets in, everybody has the benefit. Uh, what happens in like, well, when it, whenever you said earlier on, because I'm not going to question you, but like six months from now, you're not. I did not, know, I did not put a timeline. On seven it. months from I'm, now, I'm very, I'm very bullish. Okay, I'm fine. extremely bullish. But, but you know I, mean, I hope this stock market does correct on Christmas Eve because it's my birthday, and that's when I put money <laughs> into the market last year. It was the oh, best investment. Thank you. Is that what you did with your birthday money? Yes, like, what I did. I, put, I bought a bunch of tech stocks. <laughs> did you? It was the best. Wow. Yeah, yeah. After that, everything I did was silly. Yeah, and, your, and your point, your point is fair, John. Because the the truth is, I'm, I must. I don't know how many times I say to friends, like, uh, it's like just put a small amount. Like, do the boring thing, get the pension, put some money at cash that you've got to, like, even that kind of basic advice, like, have three months worth of, of salary available in case something goes wrong. Like, put, invest in a pension, do some stuff that you trust other people, and then just take a small amount and, like, do on the, like, on the on the punts. But then pe- you you suddenly get people who are not into this suddenly ring you up and go, hey, I've got an amazing idea on yeah. this or crypto. And you're like, oh, whoa, so do you he- understand what's going on here? I mean, hit me on... In the comments, hate me on Twitter for this, but there's some advantages to bad UX. And and mm. the advantages may be leaving your investments exposed to the market because mm. every major bear market has corrected mm. within insert stat from Lindsay Davis of CB Insight. <laughs> <laughs> it's something like 18 to 36 months. Mm. Everything. I'm talking about the Great Depression. Right. The worst thing you can do when I hear from friends are like, oh, man, what's happening? I think he's getting reelected. Should I sell out of my portfolio? And I want to, you got to shake them and say, absolutely not. Like that is the difference. That is a huge difference between the rich and the poor is constantly having exposure to the 8% over history that the stock market makes. So um, mm. cheers to some bad UX in certain cases in your 401k plan, provided that they provide uh, transparency in terms of their fees and fair fees. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I mean, a little bit of friction sometimes not a bad thing. Yeah. Which is really weird for me to say out loud. <laughs> <laughs> Just got to the end of that and realized how weird that was. <laughs> That's okay, the podcast after let's this. move on. Um, somebody else who is trying to bring wealth management to the masses is Goldman Sachs. So this is a story over on Financial Times. Uh, it will start offering digital services to individuals with as little as $5,000 from next year. Which I, I mean, based on Goldman Sachs, that's a big jump down from what they've been in uh, basically providing services to before. So United Capital, which was bought by Goldman in May, told the FT his uh, team would launch the robo-advisor in 2020. Lots of fun things happening in 2020. Uh, Joe Duran, the founder of United Capital, said that the services would target clients with low complexity, seems like an insult, uh, Not <laughs> uh, and not that much in assets, which also seems like an insult. I mean, this guy's definitely not working in the marketing department over there, is he? But um, I mean, it seems like Simpletons. a Simpletons. Really... Why didn't he mention Simpletons? <laughs> yeah. Simpletons with not much money. We're going to democratize wealth stuff by being offensive to people. Um, I mean, it seems like a really interesting idea. You know, it, this sounds very similar to something like Nutmeg to me. Uh, from a European perspective, it's uh, uh, the ability for anybody to start getting into passive fund investment, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I think sort of playing to everything that we've sort of just talked about, really, is, is this a further democratization of like, you don't just have to have loads and loads of money to sort of start making more? Mm. Or is it the opportunity for Goldman Sachs to extend their reach to an audience that they didn't have before? They've, did that, they've done that with Marcus. Uh, yeah. with mixed success. Marcus is doing pretty well in the US, in the UK, a bit of a rocky start, but it's getting better. Mm. So isn't it like a natural add-on, an extension? And I think we're waiting for the big vision strategy day sometime in January 2020. Mm. Uh, so we'll see the bigger picture. But I think, again, from a marketing perspective, it will make sense. We are dumbing things down or turning it down a notch, and we are making sure that we have more of a base should something bad happen. Mm. I'd take a different approach to this. This is not for the mass affluent. They acquired United Capital, and then they uh, slashed the interest rates on their high-yield interest account, which is what they were using to acquire customers in Marcus. And they did that ahead of the Fed cutting rates. So they recognized that they had already gotten access to the channel that they were most excited about, which is the Henry's, so the high earners, not rich yet. And with this account, this new robo-advisor, they've actually been in the robo-market for several years. They've bought previous fintech companies on a dollar, and they haven't been able to spin it up. This might be an opportunity to cross-sell the people that are already invested in the high-yield savings accounts that aren't United Capital customers today, but believing that the 5000 minimum is like kind of like a way to to qualify them as a potential lead. Hmm. So so you think it's, a, it's an on-ramp for 
people getting wealthier in the future? And people that came to Goldman Sachs and are just using the high yield savings because it, it, it had a really attractive rate, but didn't leave yet because you know anything else on the market wasn't necessarily competitive enough. It's like yeah. point two. It's like not much better for you to go through the friction of moving your money and and having to deal with that. But this will then keep them engaged because they have to figure out how to cross sell them into other products. You don't need a Marcus loan. Like, what else can we provide you? Mm, interesting. I mean, uh, it is interesting how much Goldman Sachs seems to be doing right now. You know, they really seem to, uh, to your point, trying to have the. Oh yeah, they're their definitely doubling. They're definitely pounds. doubling down on Marcus. Yeah. and they're really moving and shaking, shaking the the coconut tree. Mm. They've been not being uh, stoic. And There's a fintech joke in there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably. Uh, coconut is a is a challenge. It is a challenge. If you need it, if you need it. Eyebrows raised. Tech stars company. But I, I, oh, I nice. Really, I you, that, tra- that was oh, intentional. That. <laughs> I really think they're trying to, to do more to be different from what they used to be. I think there's a... It, it was interesting in the article and the way if things were phrased. They are literally trading on name and reputation to do more, mm. but they want to be different. And everything is... Uh, I, I believe it was January 20th when everything will be revealed. Mm. So it's almost like I'm expecting a, a, a new name, a new logo, uh, you know, more of a fintech approach to things. I think there's a sentiment, again, you know, of... Transformation, but they haven't been able to phrase it. They haven't been able to frame it. And the um, the comments, um, what was his name? The um, Duran um, Joe. Joe, thank CEO. you. <laughs> yeah, small small person there. Yeah. Uh, it was interesting about the uh, appeal as well because you have the ticket entrance, right? You have to have a minimum. But at the same time, he was saying further down in the article that it was also another way for people at Goldman Sachs, existing clients, to refer other people, including you know children and friends and family. So I think it's it's a bit of an interesting strategy there. Mm. This goes wealthy to, children. Yeah. Well, <laughs> this goes to Lindsay's point. It's like do what your parents said. So I always have in my my head my sister. Shout out to Zoe. She's awesome. But she <laughs> hey, if Zoe. she had a if she had a choice to like put the money under her mattress, she would. And she doesn't spend much money. She makes money, but she just won't. She's terrified about spending it. And for her, if I said to her, go to you know, something that's got a name like Robin Hood or Nutmeg. She kind of looks nervous, but when I went Marcus by Goldman Sachs, she opened an account and I think she has. I better check, but I'm pretty 90% sure that's what she's done. So if they do the same kind of, you know, funky name by Goldman Sachs, then it's someone she's heard somebody say is good. So, you, like, if you're in the fintech market, it's exciting, funky names, cool things. But actually for an awful lot of people, it... It's like, oh, cool, I get access to that, but it's under someone's nice umbrella. Mm. So, Well, you, you heard it here first, January 20th, funky name by Goldman Sachs. Yeah. <laughs> good, good, good brand. Indeed. Uh, next up, we have a story over on the New York Times. This is a bit of a sad one. So this is Paul Volcker, the former Fed chairman, dies at 92. Uh, he's best known for leading the Federal Reserve campaign to subdue inflation in uh, the late 1970s and early 1980s. As chairman of the Economic Recovery Advisory Board, he persuaded lawmakers to impose restrictions on big banks post the uh, 2008 financial crisis. Volcker <coughs> served as a senior Federal Reserve official from 1975 to 1987 and sought to limit the easing of financial regulation. Sad times. Like, you know, I mean, anybody dying ever, clearly sad in terms of the space. So, uh, you know, thoughts with his uh, with, with his family. I mean, pretty cool to have a big old rule kind of named after you. So, uh, you know, the uh, memory will live on, right? He went out when markets were on the top. And didn't Longest he? bull run. We haven't had a recession, mm. I mean, this decade. So a couple more days in the year, but incredibly it, impressive. And his accomplishments are, you know, going to be realized for generations to come. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I genuinely didn't know that Volcker was named after a man. So that's, oh, the Volcker rule? Yeah. As part of Dodd-Frank? Yeah. So, like, actually having all of that kind of under, underneath him is uh, is, is pretty, pretty cool. All right, moving on uh, from one man with lots of legacy to remember to a few who probably well, don't. That was just so like much. a shout-out to Volcker and peace to our homie. <laughs> <laughs> we'll move straight. Did feel a little bit like that. I didn't quite yeah. pour out some of this bud, but, you know, it was, uh, it was getting to that point. Um <laughs> The, the thing that I'd say is I don't think you could point to another regulator who had a bigger impact on mm. fintech in the world than Mr. Volcker, right? And the, the reason that I say that is – and it's and it's recent. It's not the 70s and 80s. It's when banks couldn't trade prop. They had to find other sources of profit, and that's when they've gone all in on new tech. When Goldman, when it was – when 
times were good and Golden was making amazing profits on their on their prop trading desks, they were not acquiring little baby fintechs. So, uh, you know, I know it's not direct and and uh, tremendous men and tremendous accomplishments, but I think it's worth mentioning that the, the I think no one's been more impactful to fintech, even if indirectly, than than changing really how banks operate. Mm. As, definitely as an individual, as you say, it's like, you know, there are there are regulators that have kind of been put up as a as a, a on a on a bit of a plinth, whether it's the FCA or whoever. Mm-hmm. Um, but as an individual to have mm-hmm. sort of done so much is 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 pretty amazing. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Moving on. So we have a story over on TechCrunch. This is SoFi re- uh, founder raises $100 million for new company. So Figure Technologies closed out uh, on $103 million in Series C funding this week. The fintech uh, was co-founded by Mike Cagney, who had previously co-founded SoFi and served as its chief executive. The company began by providing home loans to older customers recently. Uh, it also began to chase younger people looking to refinance their student loans. Uh, Figure's business is executed on its blockchain. I'm not sure necessarily. Is that cool still? Is that is that like a? Does that still get your investment or? Is I, that- I actually fall asleep whenever anyone says it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, bring John back. Uh, it will apparently be introducing a money market product really, really soon. Um, so I guess the controversy on this, to a certain degree, is Cagney left SoFi in 2017 after claims of sexual harassment arose at the San Francisco-based startup. Um, there was lots of different sort of allegations kind of flying around on this one, but I mean, it's interesting to see that. I mean, 100 million is a lot to kind of be putting in. Uh, to a company at this point, and I f- sort of feel a bit weird about this one. I don't know. Has anybody got any thoughts on it? I can speak broadly to the sector. I mean, real estate is a category that we were projecting would see rebounds in in financing this year, and Figure is a part of that. And they've built a HELOC product, so they're using home equity lines of credit to help customers, you know, unlock equity in their homes as an investment mm. rather than sitting on it because you know they're typically disadvantaged by mortgages that they can't afford. And if the housing market cracks, then it's an interesting product that unlocks home ownership in a different way. Um, layering in the student loan refi product does kind of look like it's going after SoFi, but it makes a ton of sense when you think of the reasons why consumers don't own homes today. And some of that has to do with having so much debt. Mm. And that's unique to our market because we don't <coughs> subsidize education. Mm. So there's like $1.7 trillion of outstanding debt. Like that's a big market for SoFi and, and Figure and others to go after. So the I'm, funding I'm, is is not totally unprecedented, hmm. but um, some of the you know cross products like do look a little bit less like a strategy, more like a I'm going to go back and, and reclaim some of the the work that I was trying to do. Hmm. I mean, um, many of the headlines around this one were definitely not new company do's. Do. All right, this is the first edit. There you go. Um, I think many of the headlines around this were definitely not. This is what happens when you're three beers in at this point, right? This is like <laughs> second edit. Um, <laughs> Many of the headlines on this one were definitely not really about, like, new company does interesting thing. It was mainly, like, you know, ex-co-founder of SoFi who allegedly blah, 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 blah. You know, so it kind of feels like that's the problem in this story to a certain degree. It's not really whether this company's a, a good company or whether it deserves the the $100 million in, in kind of investment that's coming to it, or um, but whether the sort of sins of past have been sort of forgiven and everybody's kind of giving him a uh, another sort of chance at this type of thing. I don't really, if I'm honest here, I don't really know a great deal about the what happened or how it happened or everything that kind of happened at SoFi, but it just seems like whatever did happen seems to have been forgiven by the investors of, of whoever's invested in this company. And now it's just like, great, have another go. Uh, and I, again, I don't know enough about these details to better basically say whether it was true or not true, but it definitely feels like $100 million on uh, an investment where you would be worried about that sense is quite a big punt to make. This is a later stage too. You're not mm. investing at the seat of the Series A. So he's already you know, been forgiven for those, those yeah. previous mis- misgivings. Um, and if you look at SoFi, they've been able to turn it around. They've brought in a CEO with previous military experience, mm-hmm. Goldman Sachs experience, and really like rebranded and re like come up in the world. Mm-hmm. And it's been impressive to see them turn it around mm-hmm. and, and actually grow in scale. Um, from, you know, a governance perspective, like that would be something I would question if I was an investor. Like you want the culture at the company to be strong, especially if your product isn't going to be able to survive if a market does you know, go south. Yeah. And also HELOC is extremely complex. Like people don't necessarily understand them. So you're gonna have to do a lot to educate your market. And if the first thing that's coming up is is, you know, slander on around what the CEO has been up to, then that's not necessarily the strongest indicator. I, I should be putting my money or unlocking my home on your platform. Mm. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm learning so much. I mean, jargon. Not, yeah, no, no, I'm learning so much about the American market. Not, not the the weird, you know, allegations stuff. More like insurance is so different here. And like student debt is so different here. We have it. Yeah, <laughs> we have oh, a you, lot of it. Oh, you have a lot of we it. We have a yeah. lot of it. I mean, like uh, generally, uh, it's like students in the UK come out with like fifty uh, about thirty thousand, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I mean, like, yeah. but, but it goes out of your taxes, un- so the government under- lends it, and then it comes yeah. out right. of your taxes. Exactly. So it's but it's 50- kind of annoying, but not like it's not. Um, a, a, a cold middle of the night panic. So you're saying that yeah. the taxes get taken out of your paychecks? Or yeah. So it automatically? Kind of, yeah, it comes out automatically in in, in the tax pay pay away P A Y E, which is the like payment. Interesting. Uh, well, and you yeah. don't pay it until you're earning over a certain yeah. amount, and it's like mm-hmm. undergrad fifteen grand, post grad up to thirty. Yeah. But here it's like you're putting big numbers in front of the 30 to kind of get to where. So it's just, it, honestly, it is just such a like education here is almost just uh, it is a, a privilege that is afforded to really, really wealthy people. I think it's good that we're using technology as opposed to puppies to solve the problem. I mean, if you were to compare the US <laughs> yeah. to the UK, right? No, blank stairs. <laughs> no, 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 that was that was no, that was a news story last time. About. Okay. Oh. <laughs> I yeah. thought you were my fintech friend. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I, I was like, okay, do it with puppies. This sounds amazing. Yeah, yeah. We, we talked about this last time. I mean, it's basically <laughs> Barclays were Can talking about yeah. like worrying about your debt and giving you a chance to take pictures with puppies, which is very juvenile. What? Um But I, I, I much, as, much as I like Barclays for what they're doing with Rise here, but like. Yeah, they they were that was ridiculous. Whereas it, but one of my questions is, can I just ask you a very specific question? You is it true that you can't? Is this insurance advice? So we like, <laughs> yeah, no, 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 we got medical insurance now. Okay, it's, yeah. it's, it's about the, puppies. Come on, no, no, but it's to do with the student debt. Is it true that you can't get rid of it even if you go bankrupt? Is that right, or did someone like? Like you can de- someone who is you panicked. can default on your student loans. You can default on um, student loans. And there are loan forgiveness programs that are often underutilized because you're getting a loan from a company like Navient that benefits off of the interest. Right. So they're not going to be incentivized to help you get out of your student debt. Mm. We're seeing like new fintech companies, and this is going to be pivoting off of the initial story, but new companies trying to help consumers better understand programs like this and unlock that and automate it with, again, fintech, not puppies. Right. Um, and that's going to be, I think, a game changer for certain consumers that might have otherwise been in debt for much longer. Right. And then again, delaying other things like home ownership. Because mm. the bankruptcy laws are, are good here. You can, you know, you can go out and come back and live your life without the shame because that's actually one of the big and problems. And run for president? Well, no, but, the, but, this, <laughs> but to be fair, this is actually one of the big problems uh, in mainland Europe. And it's also a less of a problem, but still a problem in the UK that bankruptcy comes with such shame. Oh, it does you, here too. I, I, but you oh, can come back from it. Whereas there are, there are like, this past life of mine, like bankruptcy, personal bankruptcy is like really shameful um, in, in like it, it really, it's not just shameful, it will, it will exclude you from anything for a very, very long time in certain markets. Whereas here it's like, it excludes you, but then you can get back on your feet. Which is a good thing, by the way. I know it's America. Are, yeah. Everyone's yeah, we, welcome. Yeah, yeah but it's like, yeah, like, a re- like a Phoenix story. They yeah, really the, get behind the, this stuff. The redemption here. is a good thing. Like, it, it's a very big problem like in certain mm. mainland European countries because you're excluded basically for the rest of your life. I mean, we, we've covered it on the, the show a couple of times before, but there's, there's certain providers in Spain that will literally have people follow right. you around the street. Like yeah. dressed as various right. different things to shame you of the process, wow. which yeah. I mean, just doesn't lead to good mental health. I wouldn't have thought, you know. So, so, so the fact that like the medical, in, like you can get into a huge amount of yeah. Yeah. Medical, with medical yeah. insurance, but you can go bankrupt and you can come back, is actually a good thing because there's there's, there's not there's nothing wrong with that. Sure. Whereas there are. Spain is classically a country where there's there's a very severe yeah. problem with it. You I mean, know, it, like it, you're, it once you're bankrupt, that's it. You're pretty it, much your life's. It, it can't do your credit rating any good, though, no. right? It takes quite a while to, to pull yourself mm. out. I mean, the two aspects of the story. The first is the, the reality is the best predictor of future success in terms of unicorn status is someone with a successful exit. Mm. An exit over, I think, fifty or hundred million dollars is by far the best indicator of future success. It would be a shame to think that anyone is is willing to say the ends justify the means in making an investment here. I think that goes without saying, but it certainly is. It's it's betting on a horse that has a proven track record of, of, of winning is a is a proven model and 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 aggressively being first in and, and driving momentum is why he he's been able to raise money so quickly. I think the other part is the market is so wildly ripe for disruption. Right. The the student debt providers are on archaic rails using archaic technology and providing no transparency into the fee structure and no education on uh, the optimal way to pay that back. And so 
Uh, I, I'm a bit mixed on this story, as I think we all are, but ultimately more dollars going in to solve uh, this ar archaic area of lending is, right. is probably a good thing for, for consumers. Mm. All right. Well, from one redemption story to, um, I mean, one story that's sort of in the middle to a certain degree. So this is over on Bloomberg, a story about Andreessen Bank FinTech. Uh, fintech's abusive boss sued for gender bias. So this is three women are suing Synapse Financial Technologies, naming both the company and the CEO as defendants, which is a pretty ballsy move. Uh, the, uh, they allege that Patak abused and antagonized them in meetings in private uh, and in private. The CEO made overt graphic sexual comments in front of them and to female employees and demeaned and belittled them. I'm not sure, I mean, overt graphic sexual comments sort of says that there's like a normal level of sexual comments. Like I'm like, <laughs> it feels, feels like a strange sort of categorization again. But so last year, Synapse uh, sued Glassdoor, alleging that comments uh, accusing the CEO of yelling profanities and intimidating women were untrue and uh, constituted defamation. Synapse helps companies launch credit uh, debit cards and savings accounts and has recently raised 50 million in funding so far. Oh, wow. I mean, this is a company that's been... And I mean, we've heard it so many times as like a real up and coming, doing amazing things, moving forward. Um, so it's amazing to see such allegations kind of come out. You know, I should say at this stage, none of this stuff is you guys love suing people. So I'm just going to put it out there. None of this stuff has been proven to be true yet. Is that is that going to get me out of? You're good. Yeah, I'm, okay, I'm good at this point. There was that legal advice as well? You give me <laughs> legal advice. Investment um, advice, insurance advice, and that legal advice. I have an advice. internal auditor. I you can do your taxes. Covered. It's great. It's great. <laughs> I've, uh, I'm I a renaissance you... woman. <laughs> I mean, two things. One, I, you know, I think the company's interesting in terms of a sort of category definer. Mm. So it's very sad to see this story come in this way because, you know, we consistently hear that name and people trying to aim at them and trying to do you know, uh, an, an updated version of that. I think the second part of this is whatever the outcome, the uh, immense bravery of people coming forward and, and choosing to, to, to make a point. I, I don't think this is an easy thing for anyone to do. So, I mean, all credit to the people who've done this. Let the, the like, investigation take its course, but all credit to the three people who've, who've been named in the article as coming forward. So. Mm. I mean, pretty terrible behaviour has been sort of put out there, but actually, I mean, one of the people who sort of came forward uh, in the suit had a miscarriage um, after the CEO's harassment continued and an anxiety increased, which is just horrific in terms of if those things are being sort of connected to one another. Um, I mean, fintech is sort of, I guess, a you know, uh, get shit done kind of in industry in terms of sort of moving things forward? Like, is this a, a kind of a sign of like, we probably need to ease up a little bit and make sure that actually the organizations that are being established are kind of building cultures that really sort of back what we want the industry to be? Is it a question of culture, really? Because, you know, getting shit done, that's what we all do. We're all there and we know we have to get things moving, but there's a way, there's a way of talking to people, of engaging with people. And I think that in, in the world we live in today, with all the different tools that we have. I mean, once upon a time, we were talking about it earlier, you know, the, the, the email and the chain email, and now you've got uh, different mechanism. You've got the IM messages, you've got the, the screenshots, the GIF, the emojis, the this, the that. And I think people might lose a sense of what is acceptable or not. And the, the culture is not just, here's the company culture, and read these eight bullets and that's it. You have to live it and breathe it. You really have to have uh, founders and people in the right position that inspire these people. Mm -hmm. And I, I understand we, you know, there's a lot of pressure. This is a startup, you know, they're raising cash, they need to uh, show profit and build it, and that's acceptable. But I think, especially after Me Too, that hashtag Me Too this time around. The right one, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> the right yeah, one, fine. Okay, cool. I, I find it kind of surprising because this is kind of attitude that we, we, when you read about that type of article, you think about, you know, what banking was maybe 30, 40 years ago. It's almost like Mad Men. You know, these sort of uh, derogatory comments and, and bullying people, because at the end of it, male or female, this is really bullying and belittling and, and treating people in, in terrible fashion. Mm. And um, I think the public image of fintech is to be more cool, cozy, and easier to deal with. Uh, there's Silicon Valley, the TV series, everybody would have seen it and all that, reality or myth or a bit of both. And I think there's pressure and pressure environment always trigger different reactions, but this is really abysmal mm. i mean the thing i always find really weird about this one is like it takes the person who has been 
uh, you know, uh, the subject of, of, of the sort of abuse to kind of step forward without the culture kind of correcting itself, which yeah. for me says it's more about what is being portrayed as acceptable and necessarily a one-off thing that it's like, you know, oh, you rascals, you know, like yeah. it's more like this was accepted behavior and it took three people to, to your point, well, three people to kind of come forward and go, I mean, I don't think this is cool, guys. Like, we well, need to do yeah, something about and, this. And, like, whatever the outcome to come forward at all, I don't think is, is ever that easy. I mean, the, um, there's a weird thing that I didn't particularly agree with, the fact that it was kind of clickbaited as a Andreessen Horowitz yeah. investment. I don't think – I think that was just a clever way to get people to, to look click on the article because, actually, Ben Horowitz, recent – I've just finished his book, um, you know, uh, You Are What You Do – is that what it's called? It's it basically it basically says a you set your value. Manifesto. Yeah, it's like it's like you you set your values, you mm. set your mission, but truthfully, it actually matters what you do day to day. So whatever the outcome of this story, um, it, it raises questions about like what are you doing every single day? Mm. Because it doesn't matter how good the slogan is, it's it's really about the decisions that get made when no one's looking. Mm. You know, it's a sad story. I think that if. If the clickbait, which I agree it was, raises awareness over this, then sure. then then ultimately that's a fine silver lining for me. I think we all have a responsibility. It's easy to say that entrepreneurship is about getting shit done, about walking through a wall, about whatever it takes and justify the means. But ultimately, um, people were were very hurt and continue to be very hurt. And so we need to ask a lot of questions. Mm. Um, and that, that board has some questions to answer as well as they went through the, the glass door litigation prior to this. And, uh, and to be honest, I haven't, and, you know, this is a story that makes my, uh, my stomach drop and I haven't completely digested it all, um, to, to, to form how I feel, but ultimately we need to be more aware. We need to, we have friends, we have loved ones that are working days and nights, weekends in tough situations. And when they say things are hard, um, we all need to, to, to play a, a larger role in, in making them right. Mm. I, I wonder how much. Uh, like you say, the the first few years of a startup is all about survival. Um, I mean, at the point that these organisations kind of get to, um, and I'm wanting to be like Maslow's hierarchy needs here, but like you know, they they've got some money in the bank, they can start thinking a little bit more strategically. You know, establishing values, establishing all of these things. I mean, none of these accusations are things that people aspire to be. Do you know what I mean, nobody's like, I really want to be more sexist. You know, like <laughs> this is what my value stands for. Um, but actually, like, how how do people correct at that point because it's it's something that i mean culture is the thing that big organizations struggle with most you know big banks struggle most uh, and you know not 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 sexism or racism or whatever but like cultural transformation is like the hardest thing and for a for such a, a young organization to have got into um such a sort of a disarray from a cultural perspective is terrifying really isn't it i mean because i i think so much the often um often the the message is in uh it's the intention of the people who are communicating it because like get shit done for me is like a uh we we say that you know 11fs will, will kind of say get shit done GTSD. it's about yeah, but it but it's about a point around the um, was that was that a hashtag at that point? No, that's what we used to say in audit very similarly mm. because you know men that I worked for couldn't tell me to get shit done. That's harassment. So they would just say GTSD, and, I'm like, and that was I, cool because cool. it was it was a cultural thing. I wanted to roll up my sleeves. I didn't want to be treated differently for being a woman. I wanted to you know be a part of the team. And mm. audit is a very grueling out of school job to do. You're sure. ramping from fifty to sixty to eighty to a hundred hour weeks, yeah. and you're. You're there late, and you're GTSD. But 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 I think it's a. I think it, the difference though is is if if your employer is telling you to get shit done, as opposed to we need my, to get this done. Exactly. It's my a, my point is very much is about the difficulty within the industry is not about aspiration; it's about execution. So being in a situation where you can deliver upon something in terms of actually you know getting this shit done is important, rather than actually like somebody whipping you from behind saying get this shit. You know, like the tone and the intention in those messages, I think, are very very different. But I mean, it's um it's sad to see a company with so much promise kind of get to this being the headlines that are kind of being read out in, in Bloomberg about them. I mean, you know, I think there's been sort of rumblings of this a little bit in terms of the the, the space, but, you know, it will be interesting to see how this kind of runs and, and sort of where we get to on this one. But um, I guess only time will tell. All right. 
And our finally story of the, I mean, this second half of this show has been fucking hard, isn't it? Like, <laughs> like weird Not sort of uh, abuse stuff. Do we We've have got, puppies for therapy? Yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> we're going to need some drinks after this one, you know. Uh, so, uh, and, and the finally story here is a one-digit sort code error has cost a Cambridge man his inheritance. So this is a story over on The Guardian. So uh, this, this dude, unfortunately, gave his solicitor the right name, address, and Barclays account number. But he included the, the wrong sort code. Uh, and as a result of this, his solicitor then sent £193,000 to another Barclays customer. Shit. That sucks. Ultimately, got the money back. Is that what I understand? Yeah. Well, well. So what? Thanks what to the on this? Guardian. Yeah. Well, pretty so, much. So like yes. Pressure. Yeah. Um, so the the other customer initially was like, "Tough shit, dude. You sent me the money. This is my money now." Which is technically fair. Yeah. I've definitely like, sent money to the wrong. I was going to say my friend's name, very specific, but on Venmo, and then I had to have that other person, and it was quite. It's just create a fun story, but it certainly was not to that level. And when the other impact. person has the money. It, legally, that's yeah, like, absolutely legally binding. So, so the other customer had an account with the same account number, uh, slightly different sort code, and the person refused to return that money. So, when uh, the customer contacted Barclays, uh, they said it would be returned within a week. A month later, they then <laughs> reversed that decision, saying that he'd been misadvised about the funds and being restored. Um, I mean, I'm sort of in the favour of Barclays on this one. I know it's not going to be a popular thing. I'm going to get a lot of pe people sort of saying that. But, I mean, if you... £193,000, you know I mean? You are going to check that 10 times before... 11 times before you send that amount of money, right? And so, like, why would you... Why would you do this? You're going to be... You're not going to be so, like, laissez-faire about, like, the, the numbers that... And if you, if you do this... Surely liability doesn't sit with the bank here. I know, I know. Like, if you kind of go down, like, tell it, uh, the Guardian got involved, everybody got upset. Barclays did the right thing. You know, everything is is kind of good now. But I mean, for me, this makes a real mockery of the system. Like, liability is liability. Like, if you if I just randomly take all my money out of the street when we get down downstairs and like throw it up into the uh, to the air, like, is that me? Is that like, and I then suddenly I'm like, you made me do that. Like, you made me do that thing. Then, like, am I no longer liable? And the bank's like, great, just have your money back, David. You know, it just seems, this seems very dangerous where a big, you know, public uh, paper gets involved and therefore the bank has to just pay out the money again. So you've got a whole sub story there as well. You, it was an older gentleman, I think he's uh, 72 or, mm. he, or more. Or more. Uh, and yes, the, the question of liability is there, but it's also the question of the, the whole transaction, the mismatch between the name and the account number and the password, and the, sorry, sort code, not password. Uh, in this day and age, shouldn't there be a mechanism to do this? Mm. You know, considering the amount of data we're sharing with banks and when we initiate a transfer or something that you know asks you to check or double check. Mm. Uh, a mistake is a mistake, and that's fine. I would agree with you as well that when the press gets involved and, of course, you've got the whole sub-story, it's, it's the X factor almost. Mm. So... I mean, if you're going to Venmo your friend thirty dollars for that night out you had, then that's one thing, right? If it but was like, New York, it was not thirty dollars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. that, that one cocktail you had. But, but do you know what I mean? Like one hundred ninety-three thousand pounds. You you've got to like you've got to take personal responsibility for that. Surely. I, I mean, this is. I mean, I'm coming across like a heartless dick right now. But like, I genuinely think it's like. But then you, what, what, what happens with the? Because the other end of this is somebody getting. In, in in by that that, that is the rules, right? Mm. The rules are, if a criminal rings you up and convinces you that they're who they say they are, um, and you send the money, you know the bank is required to sort of uh, try and get the money back as funds back as much as possible. But but actually, it's, it's the the the, the responsibility is on the customer, which is not fair. Like because it's it's good to uh, I've sat on one side and said, well, you know, customers should be more careful, and then. At the same time, we were saying earlier, like my mum rang me and she got somebody who'd uh, rang her up and said they were from a national bank in the UK um, that she was with and she needed to move money. And you know, did they literally say it like that? It's like, hello, uh, Mrs. White, I'm says, from a national uh, bank. And no, like, uh, okay, she alarm says, bells at that point. You know? I, I feel sorry because I've like I've thrown my sister on the bus and now I'm doing my mum. <laughs> but like, um, this happened you to know, me when I moved to New yeah. York. Really? Exactly. I had somebody calling me here from the UK and we were from the branch and I used to live in southwest London and give me a ton of details about me wow. until can I have the long number on your debit card? Like, 
hold on a second. And because of the panic and, and all that, you get sucked into this. And you, you're not dealing with amateurs. They're real professionals. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And I, 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 I'm lucky to be dealing with a global bank. Mm. I walked to my nearest branch here in New York and they, 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 they sorted it out. It was mm. fine. But it, it's the whole thing about we, we need to be, I mean, I was liable. If I had given anything, it would have been on me. But and I work in the fintech space, so I kind of read, read a few stories about this and yeah. hear about these things. Mm -hmm. It's impressive to see how quickly you get pulled into this because they instill a sense of urgency and your account is at risk and this is happening mm -hmm. and we need this now, 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 now. So you, 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 didn't, you didn't lose any money, but like, no. will, will your mum or no, she No, she right? didn't actually name the Nat. It was Nat, Nat West, right? Mm -hmm. So she was rung, they said, because Nat West actually did a good job. They said, um, you know, exactly the urgency, you got to sort it out, your know, bank's been compromised, send the money here. And she was sending it off, and luckily NatWest blocked it and called her. Um, <laughs> as we saying earlier, has now led to her being incredibly like defensive on the phone. So if I ring her from New York and the lines are a little bit crackly, I do get like, darling, what? Who? No, I don't even get that. It's just like, who? Who is this? And it's like, it's, 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 stop it's your, ringing. It's your only son. You've got what two daughters. Don't be so you, mean. Yeah. <laughs> what song did I sing to you when you? Exactly. When you guys were talking, yeah. I actually inherited a trillion dollars from. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, I just have to send wiring instructions. Listen. You know, this is an interesting story because it's a big bank, because the Guardian had to get involved, because it's a 17-year-old. But ultimately, this is a m massive lack of technology mm -hmm. that uh, you want to think, is, is fintech a bubble? No, not with archaic technology that couldn't have caught this. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that the gentleman that didn't want to take the money back had not ever received a 193 million pound wire. And uh, it 193. 3,000. 193 million? Oh, that would have been either really way. impressive. Either way. Like, I'd I would surprised. not have given that shit back. <laughs> I would be surprised if he received 1,900 pounds. Yeah. It and, would be and ultimately, silence. it doesn't take you know advanced machine learning to figure out that this is an anomaly, we should investigate this. Yeah. And, and so I think this is just like a challenge. And, and the only comfort is that FinTech is here to stay because yeah. we have a lot of work to do. I mm -hmm. mean, we, we had uh, Imran on from uh, Open Banking, actually, in the UK recently. This is definitely something that they're going to be looking at. Actually, can they? create a system that validates uh, the people that the payees are actually sure. sending the money to um, and actually it, simple technology like this is a this is a problem that technology can solve really really easily uh, and hopefully it wouldn't yeah, allow people to get into this type of situations surely you could check name and sort code yeah, yeah. I mean it's, it's oh a like, like it's like, a yeah like there'd be an, there'd be a very rare case where there's like yeah there's well, if you've got a really common name like mine this technology it, exists in the <laughs> but in the US like elderly fraud's a big problem right. and we're talking about you know he is an elderly gentleman he's not even ta being taken advantage of it was a fat finger mistake mm. like yeah your mom's being called up but like that's happening here in the u.s and people are being bankrupted mm. and like there are companies that are, are targeting this solution yeah. because dementia is a growing problem and mom, you need solutions for this mom's 65 she's not even that old but she's you know she's she's got a life she plays bridge and mahjong you know that's can we facetime her, her now yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's get so right on i mean i, I mean is there, is there any other family members you want to shout yeah there's the poor <laughs> becca she's the only mom. one who has not had a shout out <laughs> this is a for christmas i'm going to mention my entire family <laughs> <laughs> All right. On that note, I mean, it ended well. The dude got his money back. So, uh, you know, all's well that ends well, right? And then if that is not a Christmas story, then I don't know what it is. <laughs> Christmas miracle. It is. It, is. it really is. It was. There was a star and everything. All right. That wraps up this week's news show. Thank you so much to all of our guests. Where can people find out more about you, Lindsay? Um, I'm on Twitter at LC Davis 1225 or LDavis at cbinsights.com. Very cool. John. At John Zanoff on Twitter. Arno. At Arno Castanet on Twitter. Well, uh, Will White eleven FS at Twitter. Very good. And as for me, you can find me at David Brewer over on Twitter. What did you think of today's stories? I can only wait to find out on that email. So uh, let us know on all social media platform platforms where you can find us. Platforms. Wow, that was a <laughs> leave that in. Just search for FinTech Insider or email us on podcast at 11fs.com. Don't forget to subscribe to the newsletter. And for more news and more content, hit us at 11fs.com forward slash newsletter. Thanks for listening. Goodbye.